this uh, this is uh, what is today? This is the second of uh, June, 1999, and we're here at Lane Place, the home of the Montgomery County Historical Society, and we're doing a, a tape of a of a veteran of one of, one of the uh, veterans of. This man happens to be a veteran of not only of World War II, but of the Korean War and the Vietnam War. This is the first one we've ever had where we had all three war, wars involved. Uh, my name is Bob Wernley. I'm the uh, uh, chairman of the oral history section of the uh, Historical Society, and the fellow who is doing the, the uh, camera today is Mike Hall, who is the executive director of the Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, I think I'll start out by asking you to give your your full name, uh, Bill. And uh, I'm, My name is William Paul Cummings, and uh, I was born in Bird's Eye, Indiana, in southern Indiana. Oh. You never, never believe that, right? <laughs> yeah, Bird's Eye. That's, that's the one that, what was that famous remark that, uh, who was it that said about Bird's Eye? I don't, I don't remember, sir. <laughs> Man, I think it was Mark Twain said it was named after the wrong end of the bird. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> anyway, and I moved up to the Doga area when, in the third grade, and I graduated from the Doga High School. What was, your, what was your family background? What uh, uh, were you? Uh, were your parents natives here, or were you first generation? They were natives of southern Indiana and oh. Tennessee. Okay. Uh, my parents were. And uh, they were probably of English. Uh, English descent, both of them. Right. Okay. And uh, who were your parents? My parents was uh, Adrian Cummings, and my mother was Ona Jones Cummings. Uh -huh. And uh, I, really, I grew up with my grandparents. I lived with them most of my life while I was going through school. Uh -huh. And that was uh, David W. Jones, uh -huh. and uh, we grad when I graduated from Ladoga High School, I, we lived out on a farm there. On the yeah. County well, now, uh, what was your date of birth then? Uh, Twenty-two October, nineteen twenty-one. So you're how many years? <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be quite a, seventy-seven right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, you say you were, but you were born uh, down there at Bird's Eye, and that's, that's kind of out in the sticks, isn't it? Yes, it is. Where, uh, where is that near? It's close to English, uh, Jasper, huh. Indiana. Down near Gentryville, or there. Right, yeah, okay. in that territory. Okay. Yeah. And how would you happen to move up to Ladova? Uh, my grandfather uh, decided he wanted to go back, but he had a grocery store in Bird's Eye, and he decided he wanted to go back to farming. So we bought a farm up in this area here. And where was your where was his farm? It was on uh, the Putnam Montgomery County line, south of Ladoga. Uh huh. And we. You still live on that farm? Or? No. Oh no. Where? I, I live on the farm on uh, my my wife's home place. I married Betty Brits. Betty Brits, yeah. And you've been there. Yeah, I've, I've been there. <laughs> when when Warren was there, and. Uh, we, when I retired from the Air Force Service, yeah. why we bought out the airs and we live around the, the home place where Betty was. Okay, now that, that's on 1000 South. Yeah, tell us about uh, how did you have to meet your wife? Well, we went to school together, at Ladoga. Oh, so uh, I graduated in '39 and she graduated in 1940, and and uh, we went together a few years and we got married. In, 1942, uh -huh. 16th of May, 1942. So you were, uh, had you gotten into service by then? No, no, but the draft was after me at that time. Okay, when uh, you were you were drafted then? No. You weren't, you <clears throat> volunteered. I, I volunteered, I got sworn in the uh, Aviation Cadets on the okay. 16th of July, 1942, 16th. at Lafayette, Indiana. Yeah. Okay. I've only been married a couple months. And you uh, volunteer. And then actually I got my draft notice to report to the draft. So you beat <laughs> So I'm <was> close. 
And uh, what uh, what was your first assignment? Or you were you went in and and uh, uh, where did they send you? I went to uh, San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where we got our pre-flight training and all the basic training. And okay. Went through and got got all the shots and all the necessary things that yeah. you had to get. And we spent about nine weeks down there. Okay. And then went to Chickasha, Oklahoma for primary flying school. Uh -huh. And uh, we had about nine weeks there. And I went to Garden City, Kansas for basic flight school. Okay. For about nine weeks to each one of those. And on the Eagle Pass, Texas, and that's where I graduated from pilot train and got my wings. And that was on the 3rd of November, 1943. Third of November, well, you were kind of late in there, weren't you? Well, yeah, I won on one of the early ones. They didn't, they didn't have uh, room to put you in, in flight training, see? Yeah. They didn't have enough school. You wouldn't have thought at that time of the law of war was going to last so long, I, I was hoping it wouldn't last that long. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, okay, you were in, the, in flight training down there in uh, Texas, was that it? Texas, and graduated from single engine flying school. Okay. Eagle Pass, Texas, right on the border. And uh, what uh, those, of course, were, uh, what do they call those planes? That I was flying a T-6 Texan trainer. Okay. Single engine. Just a trainer. Right. All right, then uh, that prepared you for taking on the heavier stuff. That, that's right. I got, uh, from there, I got assigned to uh, pilot school out in Salt Lake City, Utah, and from there I went to in the B-24s at Boise, Idaho. Okay. And uh, I flew there just uh, about a month or so, and I went to uh, Nebraska and got a, put on a crew training in Nebraska, okay. and uh, so yeah. Fairmont, Nebraska was, was the name of the place we were. And we finished up there in March and New Nebraska on a B-24 training. Yeah. How, how come you, I don't quite understand how you switch from uh, fighters or small single-engine mm -hmm. planes over to, over to big, heavy ones. I couldn't understand the time either, but, yeah. but they need the pilots and the, the mommer uh -huh. outfit. Uh -huh. so, so I got put on as a co-pilot on a B-24 for crew training. Okay. At Boise, Idaho, and then we moved to uh, Vermont, Nebraska. Uh -huh. And, uh, okay, you're getting ready to go overseas pretty soon, I suppose. That's right. Okay. Yes, sir. Where were you, where did you we, head out to? We, we picked up a brand new B-24 at Lincoln, Nebraska. It's right out of uh, Willow Run. Ford Motor Company built it. Yeah. And the number on it was 4252-724. I'll never forget that number. Okay. We flew in overseas, went down through South America and over to Africa, and we spent about a month in North Africa, around Tunis. Oh. They were building the airfield. We were the last out, last group to join the 15th Air Force uh -huh. in uh, southern Italy, and uh, we had to wait till they finished the airfield. The weather was lousy in the spring there, and we finally moved up there. And, what, what would that uh, date have been? Oh, yeah. In May of, uh, early May of 1944, okay. when we moved up to uh, Italy. Was the war, the war was pretty far along in Italy by that time, wasn't it? Yes, it, it moved up, but they still had uh, Anzio and, and uh, I forget now, the mountainous area they were bombing there, C Caserta or something. Oh, yeah. But it had moved further north, right? Okay. And uh, did you, uh, you were flying, but you were flying out of a base in North Africa? No, we were flying out of Italy, southern Italy. Okay. Our missions. Yeah, but where was your base? Which... Southern Italy. Venosa, Venosa, Italy. Okay. And uh, what was the... Uh, uh, how big of an outfit was your, how many planes were in your outfit? We, we had uh, a whole bomb group, the 485th bomb group, 
and we had uh, 25 airplanes in our squadron, and uh, we had uh, four squadrons to the bomb group. Okay. And uh, how many people were in, for instance, on your we, on your crew? We had ten ten men per crew. And what did that consist of? We had uh, pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator, radio operator, flight engineer, and four waste gunners. I say four waste gunners. They won the ball turret and the tail turret. Yeah, where do they get shot at? Yeah, that's where you get shot at. <laughs> Oh, okay. I didn't find many places that didn't shoot at you. <laughs> okay. so I flew my first first mission on the 12th of May out of southern Italy. And that would have been 19? 1944. 19. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and what, what do you remember from that mission? Well, it, it was really exciting because we got the uh, hip they had been used to that flak flying up at you. Uh -huh. and so we didn't fly a mission, but while we got air-to-air -air damage or ground-to-air uh -huh. damage from the enemy sources. Sometimes I think that maybe we shot some of our own planes. Oh, good job. Now this was, uh, this is kind of, uh, to me, this is, sounds uh, kind of late, late in the war. <laughs> I came back from overseas in, in June of '44, yeah. and you were just you were just that's starting good. to get shot. At. That's right. I did get started good. Okay, and we, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we we continued to fly. We went to Palesi, Vienna, Beckheimer. Uh, we bombed Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. Yeah. Uh, Germany, France, Northern Italy. Were there, uh, there, there, of course, would have been planes doing the same thing coming from the north, wouldn't they? Right, only they didn't. So they'd be coming from right, both directions. They were hitting them both, both sides. Yeah. They were coming out of England, yeah. and we were hitting from the south. When did you do that, uh, Ploeste? Well, Tell us a little bit about that, because I think that was one of the most yeah. interesting stories of the whole war. What was the purpose of it and so on? The uh, Plessy had the big oil refineries there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the reason for hitting that to knock out the oil supply. So their fighters, their ground, uh, their tanks and everything, you know, they wouldn't be able to have yeah. uh, fuel to run. I forget, forget the exact date that I went to Plessy. But mm -hmm. three times and twice we came back home alone because we couldn't stay in formation, uh -huh. so it was a long trip back home. Yeah, that was it. Was really a long, yeah. long flight, wasn't it? That's right. And, and where it, did you did you start from southern Italy? Yes, to go over there. Southern Italy. Uh huh. And uh, you know, uh, yeah, it it was. Uh, they smoke it over the target all the time. They had smoke generators on that thing. Okay. And. So you couldn't yeah. see what you, you were hitting? You couldn't really see what you are hitting all the time. Uh -huh. so, but you would bomb in the general area of it when you come uh -huh. through there. But, it really uh, didn't do much good, did you? Yeah, it, it kept uh, some of the fuel from being yeah. refined. And okay. we, there was uh, the story of Pulaski is there's over 360 airplanes lost over that one target in the period of time it's being is bombed. That right? That's right. And I, I forget how many men were lost in that. that uh, How many airplanes lost, did you say? About 360. And those were pigments, weren't they? The, right. Those Mostly were bombers. Four, four engine, yeah, bombers. B-24s. Uh -huh. they, they had a few 17s in Italy. Most of, most of the B-17s were up in England. But uh -huh. they did have a, a group or two down in Did any of them try to get to Ballesti from England? No. They all came. They too long to home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, how long, for instance, how long would that flight take there from Italy? It takes uh, about eight hours. Can't imagine it. Of course, I don't. Maybe I don't know my geography that way, but 
Oh, well, but it didn't seem like it was that long a distance. Well, well. Eight hours one way or a round trip? Well, round trip. Yeah. Yeah, round okay. trip. But you see what, oh. what, what happened when you get up there? Well, you, you stay around, you get in formation uh -huh. before you ever take off for your target. Okay. And so that takes a long time to get all those airplanes assembled. Okay. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't unusual to have a thousand airplanes out there. Good. That's right. A thousand airplanes a thousand going airplane. to ballistic. Yeah. That same general area target, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, did you uh, did you feel you did any good at Floresti? Yes, sir. I think we did. Did you? Yeah, I think it shortened the war. Uh huh. And uh, all right, that was was that your first experience in getting shot at? No, sir. I, first experience getting shot at was on the first flight up in northern Italy. Okay. <laughs> But the worst, the worst one was Pulaski area. Vienna was a bad one. Okay. And uh, Munich. Okay. Well, we've had some other uh, flyers that uh, bombed Munich too. Yeah. Uh, well, tell tell us about the uh, that first one then. Let's talk about that. Your first experience on your first flight out there. We we uh, went up to Via Reggio, Italy, and. Uh, we had a uh, Martian yard with railroad cars and everything yeah. that we hit up there. And uh, as we were going inbound on the bomb run, why we got all this flak thrown up at us. Uh -huh. And we got hit and wing, knocked an engine out. And so uh, that was our initial yeah. experience in the Did flight. any of the crew get hit? No, none of the crew got hit. But we brought the airplane back safely back home. And, uh -huh. On three engines, and you were, uh, but one of the, then one of the engines got knocked out. Then. Right. Yeah. And uh, your job was to do what? My job as co-pilot was to assist the pilot and uh -huh. and fly part of the time okay. on it and take care of any emergencies that we might run into. Uh -huh. You know, like shutting the engine down, making sure the engine secure if you could do it. Uh huh. And and uh, okay, you were uh, uh, you've got some pictures, haven't you? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Bill, from uh, let's cut that. Uh, get those pictures out. I, uh, I have uh, one one picture here, the B twenty four. If you can, this picture here. That <clears throat> was a particular airplane that we flew overseas. We picked up a Lincoln, Nebraska, and we took over to. Italy, and as a member of the 485th Bomb Group, the 830th Squadron, Bomb Squadron. And uh, this particular airplane finished up the day before they had the VE day. It was the last flight of May. It had an engine out and it went into an airfield over by Yugoslavia. It flew over 100 missions. Uh -huh. That was, but that was your. That was the airplane we took over. There. Uh -huh. Right. What are these other photographs down here? They photograph. This is just uh, photographs where they went through the Pulaski oil field deal. This one is the crew that we had that uh, when we were out of Nebraska before we picked up the airplane. Is our bomb crew. This one is the uh, navigator Earl Harris. He was the one that was killed on her straight up in southern Germany, Frederickshafen, Germany. This is our bombardier, Mel Taylor, he's from California. And this is the members of our crew after we lost Earl on that one bomb run. This is after we've been flying missions. Tell us about when that, uh, that uh, fellow got killed, what uh, circumstances of that? Well, we, we were on that bomb run and we come uh, across Lake Constance heading in a northerly direction to bomb Frederickshafen, Germany, and the ball bearing works that they had there, Frederickshafen. And uh, we got terrific flak in that area. The fellow we were flying right wing on, we were deputy lead of the, the 16 airplanes. Well, he blew up and, and went down, and we got hit real bad. Uh -huh. We had a navigator got killed, a piece of flak went right up through his uh, 
That was on your plane. That was on our plane. And, and, uh, and the four gunners in the back got wounded, shot up. So. Well, now uh, the guy, the, the fellow that got hit, uh, he died right there. He died right there. That's uh, right. Did you realize that he was uh, well, that he was gone? The bombardier was right up there with him. Yeah, uh -huh. and we realized that he'd been hit. We'd been hit, and we thought we were going to have to bail out in Switzerland. And uh, some of the gunners didn't think we were going to make it, and we we were going to throw his body out and, and with a shoot on it, rather than let it crash and burn. Mm -hmm. But uh, on our way, we had a, we had an engine knocked out, and we were losing the second engine. The Bombay, the catwalk in Bombay was only about that much of a left where it got a direct hit. The Bombay doors were flapping, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we got. Being secured, and there's a P-38 come up and flew right next to us, and he had an engine out, and he didn't even wait on us. He looked us over and just went ahead because he didn't think we was going to make it. I don't think. Mm -hmm. And we got back through the Alps, and we kept getting shot at, and we got back in the home area there, and we landed on a runway, and the airplane was totaled. Then it wasn't this same airplane; it was a borrowed airplane, and we were flying then, mm -hmm. and. Uh, had the hydraulic system, we had to pump the hydraulic the gear down, the right tires were flat, and no radios, and when we landed we just went out through the weeds and we crash landed that thing, <laughs> finished it off. Mm -hmm. That that was uh, Frederick's off mission. Okay. After that, well, they sent us to Capri for a week. Uh, I was ready to go. A little <laughs> rest. Yeah, I was ready to go. Oh, yes, sir. What was Capri like? Did they have a I thought, of course, Capri would have been down there where all the fighting was going on. No, yeah, the fighting had already moved way north there, north. yeah. yeah okay. it, it was real. Yeah, I think you had a, you had one of the pictures showed the, some of the flak coming up. Why don't you get that out? I'll give it a try here. This one is the Palestia oil field, and if, if you look close, you can see how that was smoked over when we went over the bomb of that. Okay. Yeah. Here's one when we were up over Blackheimer, Germany. Again, was bombing the oil fields up in that area. And uh, that just the idea of the flak and stuff that they threw up at you. And, as a matter of fact, I got a piece of flak there at home that lodged in my parachute. Uh -huh. That's how close. Okay. Okay. And, and here's one that uh, on the Frederick Hoffman mission, where we came back, it was all shot up. That's where the gunners were back in the waist. We had over 500 holes in that B-24 on that flight. So that's when we had the engine out and the bomb, bomb doors flapping. And here's my little black book I kept all the time, which I logged all my missions in. And okay. told where we went, the date, and, and uh, well, we bombed a marshaling yard or the, the oil refineries or aerodrome or what happened. Uh -huh. uh, you know, this is the 2nd of June. Can you remember what we were doing on the 2nd of June uh, 55 years ago? Did that Got pretty good records for. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. Look like I was loafing on the second of June, thirty first of May. I went to Polesi. Oh. And on the fourth of June, we went to Turin, Italy. 
the marshalling yard, railroad yard up turned Italy. And uh, we were flying our own airplane that time, the one we took over from Lincoln, Nebraska. Huh? Uh, about those uh, uh, those flights over the, the marshalling yards, those would have been in Munich and where else? Munich and northern Italy usually. With them. You Marshall see those Italy. railroad cars down there? Yeah. Uh, now, did you know what you were bombing and whether it could have been prisoners of war in there? You didn't know what you were bombing, no. You just hit them and could you, were there a, a great uh, sea of uh, railroad cars down there? What did you see? You do that they had to marking the yards real full of uh, mobile stock, you know, trains and things like that. And that was really. Intelligence would tell us that uh, this this is a place you know where they had a lot of equipment, mobile equipment, mm -hmm. and uh, so we'd go up there and make bombs. So they were feeding you when, in other words, when you set out on a mission, uh, did you have a meeting beforehand? We had a briefing every every morning before. And uh, on a mission. the intelligence would tell you. Uh, or somebody would know from your group would have been in touch with somebody who would. That's right. Who would? They they had they had flights out, you know. You know? Maybe early in the morning or just the day before, or that would uh, give information back. Okay. And, and they tell you, well, this place is uh, has yeah. got some uh, uh, ammunition or something that ought to be hit. Right. Yeah. Okay. And usually, what they did in a, in a briefing is usually. Run about four four o'clock in the morning while you run your briefing mission, and uh, they give you the target area. They have a big map there, and they give you your target area and what type of bomb you were carrying, and, and about how long the flight would take. They give you the expected weather en route and over target, where you're going to have any uh, uh, airplane to fly cover for you uh -huh. on the mission now. On several flights, we had the P-51, the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh, the uh, black one. Yeah. Uh -huh. They they used to come up alongside and say, "Big brother, this is a little friend. We <laughs> we've got you." So <laughs> you knew who it was then. <laughs> radio flying P-51s. Usually, you kept radio silence pretty well. Uh -huh. You didn't talk a whole lot. But uh, they would have come from a different air. That's right, different. So airfield. you didn't know that. Uh, but they, uh, and and with the tail insignia, you could tell uh -huh. where they were from. But but that's usually what happened on the mission. Then then you got the mission over with. You come back and they debriefed you. You know, you went in and you talked about uh, what you saw, what happened, uh, if you lost any airplanes, saw anybody bail out, where were they bail out? Because uh -huh. um, some places they could go in and recover. Yeah. Uh, if they were, for instance, I suppose in Switzerland or somewhere like that, they could they could get them back. Well, Switzerland usually uh, you in turn for the duration. Yeah. But Yugoslavia, they had some good guys and some bad guys, and if yeah. you were lucky enough to go down to good territory, yeah. uh, they had an airstrip in there where they'd send a 47 in at night and pick up these guys that went down. Uh -huh. That they had there, and maybe they'd be back home the next day. And, uh, they lost the airplane over there. Uh, did you? Uh, which were the which were the good guys and the bad guys? Well, I could never figure it out. There was one guy named Mahalovich. Mahalovich was, was over there, yeah. And uh, I can't remember the other fellow's name. Mahalovich, I think, was the was the bad guy, wasn't he? I think so, yeah. And. Uh, was it Tito? Uh, oh, Tito wasn't. He wasn't there yet. Not yet, but. But I can't. I can't remember the name. Uh, when Tito got a hold of, uh, he sort of ruled out with an iron hand and kept yeah. things under control over there. Yeah, that's right. All right. Now. Uh, but uh, we lost. We thought, lost three of our group commanders while I was flying there. The fellows in charge. Yeah. Colonel uh, Pop Arnold. He bailed out over Blackheimer, German area. Was he rescued? He was a PW for the rest of the oh. rest of the thing. 
And I, I didn't realize that uh, he even survived the thing until just about six or eight years ago. Yeah. What was your What was your rank uh, at that time? At that time, I had a second one over the second lieutenant, and I got a first lieutenant promotion while I was overseas. Okay. Yeah. You were probably commissioned a second lieutenant. When I graduated pilot school, when I graduated from pilot school in November, of 40, 1943. Okay. And uh, well, uh, I was starting on these marshaling yards. Uh, did you think you did any good on some of those? Some of those? Yes. Several times you could see explosions and things down there where oh. you would hit something that uh, probably carrying ammo or, or fuel or something like that, yeah. you know, it, that would just yeah. blow up. And... Okay. Well, uh, what were some of your other missions that you took? You may... How many? How many missions did you fly all together, do you remember? Fifty. Fifty? Yeah, we had and, fifty and missions. On your stint during World War II? That was WW2, yeah. Okay. And most of those occurred, uh, would have occurred, to, I'm, go ahead. I, I started on the 12th of May of 1944 and I finished my missions on the 5th of September 1944. I didn't have to spend the winter over there. Okay. I came home. <laughs> See, that thing run on into 1945. Yeah. yeah. You came home early too, huh? I came home on, uh, <laughs> I came home in, uh, on June, June 4th, 1944. 1944, yeah. I was, I was in that, uh, I got out, I, I yeah, I came back in, in 44. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so uh, I was in probably a long time before you were. I think I'm a little older than you are. Well, I would would imagine that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, now, does that uh, does that about cover it for World War Two? World, World War Two that about covers it. And uh, you were. Uh, what happened uh, at the end of World War Two? What? At the end of World War Two, I. When, after I finished over there, I came back and I went, was assigned at Harlington, Texas, and they had a gunnery mm -hmm. school. But they kept you in. Yeah, at, at Harlington, Texas. Well, and I, I flew, there I flew uh, B-24s for a little while, and then I got to flying a P-39, P-63 airplane. That's a single-engine fighter type airplane. But were you getting ready to go to Japan, or what was No, it? no. I just, they were training crew members. Munitions. Okay. See, see what what you do is you go out there and you make passes at them on the P thirty nine sixty three and they simulate firing at you. Uh -huh. they, were, they were getting used to it. And then then we're well, they, when these the, fellows were getting ready to go to Japan. Yeah, yeah they were getting training at the end. Okay. But Padre Island, there's, you heard so much about probably if everybody goes down, down there. Southern Texas. Uh, yeah, we used to go along there and just fired that, you know, so you could see the splash uh -huh. and you could tell what you were shooting. So that ought to be full of lead, it ought to sunk. <laughs> <laughs> well then, what, uh, uh, you stayed in the service then? Uh, I, I got out temporarily, and, uh, but I stayed in reserve program all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got, came back up here, I, I was assigned to reserve organization, I flew out of stop field, and then I got back in uh, active duty service and at Atterbury Air Base at Columbus, oh. Indiana. And uh, at that time I was flying out of, out of there all the time. Yeah. So, uh, but you were uh, reserve status and you were farming or what were you doing? I, actually I was uh, doing a little, little flying part of the time. Okay. Yeah. I flew some up to Lafayette. When I was out of service. Well, what, uh, what, what was your occupation? Your pilot, pilot instructor, pilot. yeah. Oh, pilot instructor. Yeah. Okay, who were you working for? I was working for uh, Swords Aviation okay. at the time. Did you know Chet Hill? I knew Chet, yes. The, uh, I, knew, I knew when he came down and started the 
the airport here. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, he was. Uh, uh, well, he was a pilot in World War II. Too. Yeah, I think he was an instructor. Yeah. In, in World War II. Okay. Well, after after I came back to uh, Atterbury, Indiana, why well, we started flying uh, down there was a troop carrier outfit. Four thirty fourth troop carrier group. Okay. And, and I was a squadron operations officer down there at the time. And we we started flying uh, we had C forty five, C forty sevens, the old Goonie Bird, you probably heard the term Goonie Bird. It's which is a DC three civilian type airplane. Then we uh, got into C forty sixes. Okay. And uh, we flew forty sixes and drop drop troops down at Camel and uh, Pope, Pope, Air Pope. Force, uh, Pope Air Force Base or, oh. or Fort uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Okay. And uh, that was our primary mission. Then we just go around and, uh, and dropping troops and hauling cargo and stuff all over the states. Well, there was a little bit of a uh, there was a period there of about how many years between the, the World War Two and the, in the Korean War, uh, where were you when uh, when the Japan surrendered? When when Japan surrendered, I was uh, in a reserve organization, uh, flying out of Stout Field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When Japan surrendered. Okay. Were they talking about sending you over there at that time? Well, yes, sir. Uh, you were kind of anticipating that. Yeah. You got some more. I, I got a picture here, I'll show you. Okay. My brother, my younger brother's in the Air Force too. Oh, he is? Yeah, he was, yeah. And uh, he was flying reconnaissance over in Japan. And, uh, maybe I can. Here's what was left after they bombed Hiroshima. Hiroshima. You two buildings, buildings left. Put that up here. That was taken in August 1945. My brother, my Your brother brother. took that yeah. uh -huh. on the plane he was on. I just thought it might be a point of interest. For yeah. Me. Was he, uh, he, he, what crew was he on? He was a pilot and he was flying B-24 reconnaissance out of there. Uh -huh. He was not on the Enola Gate. No, no. Okay. But, uh, the Enola Gay. Bill. Oh, go ahead. The Enola Gay. Uh, no. Can you think of the fellow's name? Rickenbacker? No, Trivet. 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 Yeah. Well, he came to the B 24 base where we were had been stationed, uh -huh. and he, he picked selected people, and that's what he formed his crew out of uh -huh. for that Enola Gay flight. So, that you so a little history on where we had been. He yeah. came in there and he, he got his crew out of there. Yeah. Uh, Bill, you got some pictures of yourself when you were back in those days. Let's see what you looked like when you had some hair. I had some hair. That, right there is when I graduated in pilot training or when I was going pilot training. Okay. Well, you got another one there. Yeah, this is. This is later on. This is when I was uh, a blue suitor in the Air Force. You know, they changed from the, the old brown and when the Air Force. Oh. Was, oh, when when did that occur? Yeah, I was a major at that time. And, uh, I think that's probably about 1960, 64. Uh huh. What are all those uh, decorations there? Well, I can't remember all of them. Okay. They're listed here. <laughs> you got any other pictures there? That, that was a P-39, P-63, yeah. I don't know whether they ever not. So I had one. Here's one of my younger days. You were that, a, that's when I was brown too, yeah, when we graduated. Thank you, do. you didn't have so much flesh on you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I've never got a B-24 if I hadn't had. This is, this is that P-39. Uh-huh. That, that 
through after I got back. I don't know if any more or not. I think that's mostly. Here's, here's when I was flying C-46s. The C-46 out of Atterbury Air Base. Okay. I was telling you about. That was after. Yeah, that was before the Korean deal. It's after World War II. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay, now let's get into Korea. Okay. Or are we too soon? No. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I got uh, sent down to, we moved down to Lawson Field out of Atterbury Air Base, Columbus, Indiana, down to Lawson Field at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And I got a single assignment over to Japan at that time, and shipped over there from the Korean thing. Uh, in 1952, I can't remember the exact time, but in 1952 I went over to Japan and I was uh, stationed in southern Japan. My primary job was assigned to a radar site and I run a ground control intercept. And I'd never seen a radar scope in my life, you know, until I got over there and I worked on that a little while. But radar scope? Yeah. Oh, that's right. That, that's where you watch okay. the airplane movement through, through the air, to get a reflection on it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, ground control intercept is where you run airplanes in to fire on another airplane, a target enemy airplane. So, and oh. I, I run that for a while. And uh, in my flying, I flew C-46s over there with an outfit, and then we flew up to Korea and hauling uh, all kind of cargo and stuff up there. But I was actually stationed in Japan at that time. Yeah. And uh, they transferred me out of that up to right outside of Tokyo Air, Johnson Air Base in 1952-53, uh, and I got to fly in B-26s out of there. And we, we flew over to Korea and flew support missions for the Army and the Marines over there out of Johnson Air Base. That was in late 52, 1953. Uh-huh. So uh, I, I got about... Uh, was that the same, uh, it was not the same outfit that you were in in World War? No, sir. No, sir. Well, what, what outfit would it have been? What do you call that? The, the outfit that I flew in southern Japan and C-46s were the, the same outfit I was in over here at 434th okay. Carrier Business. And the B-26 outfit was a six, six tow squadron. Were any of the same uh, uh, officers or men on your crew then? No, not the ones They're that had been in World War II. They're all, all different. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what were your, your say you from missions from out of Japan, out of Tokyo? Uh, out of the Tokyo air. We we would deploy and we'd go over and stay in Korea two weeks to a month, and then we'd come back home. Well, you'd uh, come back home to Japan. And I'd take back home to Japan, that's right, Okay. our home base. Well, where, where were the air bases in Korea? In Korea? Yeah, South, uh, South Korea. In South Korea? Well, they had Incheon with K-14, we, we operated out of there. Osan was K-55. Uh -huh. Pohang was down in more or less in Southern, that was K-3. And uh, Pegu was K-2. Kunsan, we operated out of, was uh, down at uh, uh, K-8. And Busan, I forget the number on that thing, the K-9 or something like that. That is right on the Southern tip, Busan. Now, were, uh, you were flying out of Japan, you'd go over to uh, Korea for uh, for a few weeks, right? Uh, and then you'd uh, and you'd take off from Korea and fly north, right? To, and uh, you get were you getting shot at from there, right? We get shot at, but uh, fortunately, I never did get hit up there, uh -huh. like we did in WW two. Uh -huh. um, and a lot of it was night operation too, in the uh -huh. B-26. And uh, 
the, uh, the uh, who was your commanding officer there? And what rank were you at that time? At that time, I was captain. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, who was in charge of your outfit? Colonel Colonel Ash. Oh. I forget his first name right now. Was the uh, oh. CEO of the outfit. Uh, did you get uh, did you get involved in, or did you hear anything about this MacArthur's thing? That we go, oh. no. <laughs> yeah, I did. That was probably out of your realm, but uh, yeah, it was political. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't happen to see Harry Truman when he got there. I didn't see Harry at all. <laughs> and uh, you probably you never saw MacArthur, I suppose. Never saw MacArthur. Uh, well, uh, how many missions did you have there in Korea? I had 20, 27 I had in the B-26, mm -hmm. and I had uh, 35 in the C-46 and combat support when I was flying out southern Japan. Uh -huh. but when I was in southern Japan, my primary job was running radar school. But you never got hit when you were in, never got in hit. Korea. How long a, were you in Korea? That was a nice change. Uh, about six months. Okay. And then you were to return to the States. I returned to the States in uh, 1953. I came back to the States. I think it was about August. Okay. And I, I went to Scott Field down in Belleville, Illinois from uh, the Korean assignment. Okay. And I stayed at Scott Field at that time as a training command there, the headquarters of the Air Training Command for the U.S. Air Force. So you stayed in the service? I stayed in the service on, and then on. Okay. Right. And uh, you didn't think there would ever be another war, I suppose? No, sir, I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> did there, did there, there was another war after that? That's right. Uh, when did you get involved in that, if you did? Well, I, I got involved in uh, that in 1963. Okay. Uh, I, <clears throat> I just to bring you a little bit up to date there. I was with the Air Training Command and I, at Scott Field and from 1953 until 1958 I flew B-25, C-47, T-33s, uh, Bear C-131 and C-118 come out there. Well, Air Training Command moved down to Randolph Field and Military Airlift Command moved in there mm -hmm. at their headquarters. And so I stayed there and I would change it over and I flew for them, the Military Airlift Command. So. Okay, and uh, so when did you, you got sent over to Korea. Only well, over the... I had one more step here. I okay. Gotta, I got to explain. And so they they sent me to school under the Institute of Technology. I, at that time, I went to Purdue for two years, Aeronautical Engineering School. Oh my and goodness. That was 1958 to 1960. Oh. In August 1960, and I finished up there, and then I, that's where I went overseas to Japan again. Went to Japan. Yeah. Yeah, in 1960. I was with a 8th Tech fighter wing. Of course, there was no fighting going on in there. Well, no, not reported. Oh? <laughs> what do you yeah. mean by that? Well, it was going on over there at that time, back in the 60s, down in Vietnam and those places. Oh! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and we supported some of the operations down there from Japan. I was in southern Japan at Izuki area. That was before the uh, United States got involved in that? Well, they were, yeah. You were flying? I, I didn't, I wasn't down there at that time, no. Uh -huh. Early on, I didn't go down there, no. Uh -huh. I went I went down there uh, from Japan in 1963. I went to South Vietnam and uh, Natrang Air Base. I was Air Base Commander of Natrang in South Vietnam in 1963. Who were you training? We, uh, they were flying missions out of there then. Who was flying missions? Both, both the, uh, 
Well, it's supposed to be the Vietnamese were flying the T-28 missions out of that air base at uh -huh. that time, and they had, and we had uh, American pilots in there flying with them. Oh. And so primarily the American pilots were one of doing the, the bombing, but they were training Vietnamese pilots at that time. But we weren't officially in them. We weren't officially in it. In the conflict. But, but they had airplanes and they had places all over the area over there. Thailand, Laos, uh -huh. but it wasn't all reported that way, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, did, then did you get involved in, in the, the were, training uh, pilots? Uh, no, actually I didn't. I was flying C-47s out of there by the time for airlift and uh, uh -huh. parts and equipment different areas. Okay. But, uh, I didn't, I didn't fly any missions there. Usually the military air advisory group was the one that was working with the Vietnamese flying okay. the T-28s. And uh, did you ever get involved in the flying missions in, in Vietnam? In my second time there I did, yes. See, I, I came back, I came back to Japan and then we got uh, we changed over airplanes from the F-100 to the F-105 and the attack fighter wing, and they moved the attack fighter wing from Itazuki Air Force Base in southern Japan up to Yokota Air Base outside of Tokyo area, and I was due to rotate home after four years in Japan. What time I went to TDY someplace, uh -huh. and so uh, I came back home and. Uh, got assigned a 105 outfit at McConnell Air Force Base, Wichita, Kansas. And that, that was about June of 1964, June or July. So, we had 105s there at McConnell, and I went back again with the 105s, went to Takali, Thailand in 1965 in about August of 1965 with the F-105 program, oh. and we flew missions out of there. Well, what kind of missions were those? Bom bombing missions, strafing oh. missions, yeah. fighter, fighter top operation. So. And did you get hit there? We got hit a few times, yes. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, with the, your planes get, get shot up, did you ever Having trouble getting back? No, I, I was forced enough I didn't get hit that bad uh -huh. to get back. <laughs> Matter of fact, I didn't. I wasn't interested in getting hit at all, I tell you. <laughs> Some of those fellows uh, weren't that fortunate. Yeah. I, I, knew, I knew 19 of those pilots that came out of uh, Hanoi Hilton that, did. that I'd been with, yeah. Uh, they were rescued from there? Yeah, you know, they were the POW. Yeah. They were POWs, and then when they brought all those fellows back home yep. from Hanoi, there was 19 of those fellows I'd flown with and knew in my lifetime there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so. Did you know uh, Senator McCain? No, I didn't know him. No, yeah. he, was, he was Navy, wasn't he? Yeah, I guess yeah, he was. Yeah. I didn't know McCain. But he was in the Hanoi. Yeah. Hilton. yeah. Let's take a little rest here, Mike. And to warm up. Okay. All right. Uh, Bill, uh, one thing that slipped by me was uh, the fact that somewhere along the line here, jets began to come in. And uh, you got involved in those, and you said during World War II, the latter part of World War II, uh, the Germans started to have jets. That, that's uh, correct. And when were you conscious of that? Well, the, the intelligence report said that they do expect them on oh. our missions. Okay. And uh, we had our tail gunner reported seeing a 262, a ME 262 come through our formation or close by our formation yeah. one time. And yeah. it was going so darn fast, you know, it, it was a lot different a prop job. Yeah. And uh, also they had the ME 163, but we never did uh, have that reported. Yeah. And you po you were pointed out there somewhere along the line, you saw a whole a bunch of Germans coming at you. Right. Uh, what, what? One time it reported that we had, when we were climbing out, we never did 
we're quite at altitude we were supposed to be, which would normally be around 23 to 25,000 feet, we'd normally bomb at, and we'd leave the ball turret down while we were climbing out to not use so much fuel. Mm -hmm. You get the drag, and so we didn't even have the ball turret down. We had 19 ME-109s come through the formation head on one time. And uh, it spread up some of the people, and we lost a few airplanes at that point. And, but uh, they circled around, they come back, and they started trying to pick off the stragglers yeah. that they'd uh, disrupted. But uh, that was the most we'd ever reported coming through at one old time, one, uh, at one time. Yeah, was, some of those fellows were lost and uh, parachuted right. out. Right. Yeah, some of them killed, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I was very fortunate. I never had to bail out the whole time I was in, um, in the Air Force. Yeah. And uh, uh, another thing that Mike has brought up here is to uh, cover a little bit more of this Vietnam uh, experience that you had there. Yeah. We had, uh, we, we had one squadron deployed out of uh, McConnell Air Force Base, Wichita, Kansas over to Top Lee, Thailand, mm -hmm. and that was uh, probably around September, I think, of 1965, and we went over and stayed over there for three months. At the same time, at the air base, while they had a squadron out of Yokota, Japan, we had three squadrons down there that we operated out of mm -hmm. at, Tok, at Tok Lee. And, uh, we would fly missions on a routine basis, you know, more all day, all day life practice, bomb them, and go up north. And yep. Uh, no, we we also well, also I ask you uh, about strafing. Of course, in the bombers you didn't strafe, that, but that, did you ever fly the planes where you strafe? Yes, oh. we we used strafing, and the F-105 carried a 20 millimeter load, a 1,028 rounds on that, and it's good for 10 seconds if you just held the trigger down. It was gone. Oh. So. Where did you strafe? Where? You usually uh, strafe compounds where you, they've been reported for they had encampments of people, and also some of the rail up around the. The Red River Valley, why they... The Red River Valley? Yeah, it's up at uh, Hanoi area, what they call okay. the Red River Valley. And, and you go up there and you straight those rail lines and, and uh, try to do a way to interrupt their supplies. Yeah. Now, uh, Bill, what what did you do after the war? After yeah. the last war? Well. I got one more step here I need to tell you a little okay, bit about. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I, I came back to the States and, and I, well, I was still assigned to Wichita, Kansas. And uh, I came back from Thailand then and I stayed there until 1968. And uh, I got reassigned in 1968 uh, to Ethiopia. I was a military advisor to the Ethiopian Air Force and uh, at that time I was chief advisor to the Ethiopian Air Force over there huh. and uh, I, I was stayed over there from November of 19, 1968 until February of 1970 and I would have stayed longer but uh, one of your presidents Nixon said we got a reduction in force you know so I had enough time for retirement, and so they sent me back home, and I got out of service. And what was what was life in Ethiopia? Oh, it was a good assignment. Was yeah. it? Yeah. Where were they? What? I was I? stationed at Addis Ababa. Were you? Yeah. yeah. I what was, kind of a, was there any fighting going on there? Well, yeah, they had civil war going on up, yeah. up north a little bit. But ways. you didn't get involved in that. Except the only thing I knew was what was going on because of the advising the Ethiopian Air Force, you know, and we'd loan them some planes. We had some F-86s, F-5s, and that's that. Uh -huh. They'd come back with holes in the airplanes and say, hey, how'd you get those? And they said, 
oh, was out training a ricochet, you know, well, somebody was shooting at him. I know what happened. <laughs> that was a good assignment. Yeah, and I, I've been to a couple of reception things with old Haile Selassie. Uh, you read my book, so yeah, us. Yeah. <laughs> when he was still in power. Yeah. But, yeah, that was a good assignment. Whatever happened to him anyway? Well, they, they, they killed him? Yeah, they finally yeah, huh? killed him. Yeah. They, they killed him by and somebody else took power. One of the army guys took power, old Marion yeah. Highland, that was over there at the time. But when I came back from that assignment, that's when I retired from the Air Force. Where did where did you live when you were in uh, uh, Ethiopia? I mean, what kind of a living conditions? We had a uh, nice nice home there that they had rented. There's a lot of different uh, elements. Uh, the Italians. Did you bring your wife over? Betty Betty was with me. Yes, she. We traveled over together when when I got assigned over. And right. That was one of the stipulations, you know, for the military advisor. If you were married, yeah. uh, bring your family in. How many? What was your family? What did your family consist of? Just Betty Just and I. Just yeah. so, you. Did you have any children? I got two boys. Uh -huh. uh, the older son, David, and he's living on the farm down here where we live right now in one uh -huh. of the houses. And Philip, and uh, Philip's the youngest one right now, and uh, he he spent a a year in Vietnam in the infantry. Philip uh -huh. did. David couldn't, uh, he had had polio when he was six years old. He, he oh. wasn't capable of getting in the military, but, but they were with us in Japan. David spent all four years in high school while we were assigned to Japan. Right? Yeah. So, so just Betty and I went to Ethiopia, and uh, she could travel with me when we were flying. Uh, we had a C-54 and we had seats available when we would go fly away. Uh, she could go with me. We went down to Kenya a couple of times, over to Tehran, Iran, and up in Germany, Athens, uh -huh. uh, Greece, and had a, had a good time. Yeah. But, you know, uh, a lot of people had kids, young kids and everything, where they couldn't travel. But if you had oh. a seat open, why she could go, and it was authorized by, by the government. Or did you, uh, you must have been at Tehran before they had all the... Yeah. Well, the Shaw yeah. lost power. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long were you in Iran? Oh, we just spent a week over there. Did you? Yeah. And when? one one of the reasons we had flew out of the country, you know, or flew out of uh, Ethiopia, because we were required to get uh, so many night landings, uh, instrument landing approaches, and everything. And those Ethiopians, they wouldn't turn the lights on at night at the airport there. So. Even even the commercial airlines couldn't land at night over there. Did you land at a Maribad? I mean, uh, Maribad the Airport there in in Tehran. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's right. Where'd you stay when you were in? We stayed at the International Hotel downtown uh -huh. there on Ferdosi Street. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> see, that's where I was. Is that right? Yeah. I was yeah. In, when you when were you there? I was there in. Uh, Forty-two. Forty-two. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, all right. After you, uh, and you went into business after you, after you got out of the service. Well, I, I worked for somebody else after I got out of service. Did you? I uh, went to commuter airline. I flew commuter airlines uh -huh. out of Illinois and Indiana and Iowa and Missouri after I got out of service. What was it? What was the name of that outfit? Red, Red Airways. Red Airways, and the first day we were stationed at Danville, Illinois. They were home base, and they moved down to Terre Haute, Indiana, home base. When I started with them, after I retired, they only had one commuter airplane that they were operating, primarily Danville, Illinois, Chicago, and back. But uh, That's I, not still in No, they, they sold out oh. eventually. But, but I stayed with them and uh, I became director of operations for the company and uh -huh. and we had uh, 46 airplanes when I left them in 1981 yeah. Yeah. And, and I was responsible for hiring all the pilots and shit that got trained and the, the flight attendants and, and uh -huh. dealing with FAA and that was the biggest yeah. headache you've ever run into. Yeah. When I got 60 years old I said I've had enough of this stuff. <laughs>
and I got out of it. But uh, I, they sold out to People's Express, and People's Express sold out just shortly thereafter to Continental Airlines. Oh yeah. And so that's how. Is that they uh, are they still running that? Uh, are they still flying those planes down there? Was it Danville or somewhere? Danville, Illinois, is where we started out, but uh, then we moved to Terre Haute, Indiana. No, they're not the same company or anything like yeah. that. Uh, American Eagle or something's flying out of Terre Haute yeah. now. They they keep changing so rapidly that you don't know who. Uh -huh. But but I, I got a lot of experience after that. Uh, Bill, tell uh, about uh, about all these fellows that you flew with. You ever see any of those fellows anymore? Yes. Uh, every year we have a uh, reunion for the 485th bomb group that uh, in World War II, uh -huh. and uh, last year we had a Louisville, Kentucky. And this year we, in September we got one at Denver, Colorado, uh -huh. and so everybody gets together that and all the people that can make it. And uh, last year we had five of our crew. That's all that's left. Uh -huh. It's five of our crew out of the ten, uh -huh. and. Uh, we were all there for the reunion. Uh -huh. All the wives come? Pardon? I say, I guess the uh, families come to Oh, yes, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, right now, a lot of the uh, kids, grandkids are bringing the... Bringing the, their the families. Old, the older people, yeah, uh -huh. in, the, in the reunion, which is great. I might have to do that one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> what about your... Uh, uh, your brothers, if, uh, we were talking a little bit about that. Uh, you, you mentioned that your brother had been in the Air Force and so on. I don't think we got it on the tape here. Yeah, my, think. my younger brother uh, went through pilot training and uh, he, he went through a little later than I did. Uh, what was his name? Alan Ray. And was he from Montgomery County he too? Was from Montgomery County, yeah. He graduated from the Dover School. Uh -huh. and, uh, he, uh, he went through pilot training and he flew 24 uh, B-24s, reconnaissance in World War II in the Pacific. Uh -huh. And uh, I showed you earlier a picture of that yeah. Hiroshima that they'd go yeah, in and take a picture afterwards. And, and what happened to him? He uh, was on a trip down to the cart field in the Philippines and they flew into the mountain down there in December 1950. and. Uh, uh, the whole crew was lost on that. But he was stationed at that time at Haneda Air Base in Tokyo. Oh. Area. And uh, his wife and kids are, well, his wife was from Ladoga also, Joanne Lou Allen, that he married. And and he's got uh, one of his sons live up here, Brock Cummings. I don't know if you ever know him or not, but he lives here in the Crawfordville area now. Brock, Brock coming, uh -huh. and uh, I forget where their daughter lives now. She lived down south someplace. What about the other brother? My other brother, uh, Prentice Cummings, and he was about 18 months older than I was. And uh, he got in the Navy, he joined the Navy, and he went through a boot camp at Great Lakes, uh -huh. and uh, he became a chief petty officer. And uh, he got on his sea duty Why he was on uh, USS UL Scott and they got sunk over off the Casablanca coast one night, uh, the U-boats over in that area. And then he was on uh, Warwick for a while, U.S. Warwick. But he survived. He survived, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said he'd had enough of that Navy stuff. So uh -huh. when his time was up, why he got out of service and and he worked for Indiana Farm Bureau for a long time, uh -huh. and out of Rensselaer, and then he, he worked at Indianapolis and retired from Farm Bureau at Indianapolis, and he moved back to Rensselaer after that, and uh -huh. so that's where he's retired right now. Yeah. So that was just three, three of us boys. And mm -hmm. Okay, I think that maybe we're all done. Bill, is. There's one more thing I, I want to bring out here, that you're the commander of the local of Byron Cox Post. 
of the American Legion now, and you been uh, commander last year, were you? Yes, sir. I was commander in 98, 99, as Cox post 72, uh -huh. and uh, been re-elected for okay. 1999, 2000 year. Okay. So, is that, is that, that's kind of a busy job, isn't it? Well, keep, keep it busy, yeah. You were, uh, as a matter of fact, I, were, I read in, in the paper that you gave, you were out of Memorial Day. Yes, sir. <laughs> And you you made some sort of a speech out there. That's, right? that's right. I gave yeah, a memorial just, speech just uh, two or three days ago. Wasn't yes, it? sir. Memorial uh -huh. uh, on the thirty first. And but you know, I had my uniform back on after thirty years. <laughs> that served. <laughs> yeah, it fit pretty close, but I I wore my uniform. <laughs> <laughs> Say, I have one thing that I think think we all ought to know. I couldn't help but think when I saw uh, that uh, group of guys going out to the cemetery, how did you ever get along without Andy Browning? Uh, Andy no Browning way. used to be out there. Yes, sir. He, he was every one of them. Every year. Yeah, every one. He didn't miss. Uh -huh. And if, it's difficult, I tell you. Andy is. A, he was a wonderful he, fellow. He is. He, he knew what was going on at that boat. And, uh -huh. and, uh, he couldn't be couldn't be the better fellow than yeah. 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 And, yeah. and Andy was also involved in in the forty and eight. Yeah. Been chef together there, and I had the chef together on that ninety seven yeah. and ninety eight. Yeah. Uh, which is a, a fun and yeah. organization of the. And yeah. You ought to become a member of that. <laughs> <laughs> You're a member. I'm not fun. I'm not fun <laughs> I, I got too many things going now. <laughs> did, yeah. did, were, were you in the, uh, back, do you remember back in the Legion when Ted Groner was president, was commander? No, I wasn't a member at that time. You weren't? No. Oh, yeah. Ted was my back door neighbor. Is that right? Yeah. I had, well, I was flying so much and all that stuff, you know, yeah. and I just didn't figure oh. I had time for all of it, so yeah. I, I wasn't. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, I think that's about it. No, sure do, thank you. Yeah, enjoy your it, enjoy <laughs> it. You know, some of the fellows have been trying to get me up here to do this for a long time. Yeah, ago. well. <laughs> Andy was one of them. Claire was one of them. You know I could never get Andy to do this. Is that right? I, I tell you, we, 